Um, so talking about model tuning and the dangers of overfitting, I was happy that once we got into this, we didn't actually um, go through with the actual model tuning. So I'm basically setting up uh, chapter 13 and 14. So you're welcome for that, but thank you for not having me do any very costly models in this. So today what we're talking about is, is you know, being able to recognize what tuning parameters are, hyperparameters, um, structural parameters, whatever you want to call them, and then maybe a couple examples of when parameters should not be tuned and those types that shouldn't be tuned. We'll talk about some of the different metrics that you can use and where they can kind of lead you astray using the same example they use in the book um, with slightly different data. We'll talk about um, poor parameter estimates and overfitting. Um, and I just have one you know, example of that. I think we all generally understand why you don't wanna do that. And then we'll talk about different strategies for optimizing um, the parameters. And then again, I'll set it up uh, showing where, the, where does you would set in the parameters to tune in different ways to finalize those as we go. If you have any questions, feel free to just jump in. I can't see the chat screen right now, but um, I'm sure John or somebody will keep me, keep me honest. So uh, tuning parameter, um, what is it? So tuning parameter, we, you know, we talked hyperparameters or structural parameters, but these are things that we as the model builders can decide um, basically what, what those should be. We decide to tune those. It's something the data itself can't directly estimate. Um, so there's really kind of broken down into three different, so hyperparameters are typically looked at with machine learning. So these are things, again, the, the model itself can't determine, um, but we can set limits for that. Some examples uh, using boosting algorithms, the number of boosting iterations or something that we would set the data can't um, tell us what that is. Uh, neural networks, the number of hidden units or type of activation function. Those are things that we would set. Um, going down to random forest, which is some of the examples we'll use. Um, the number of predictors that you use to, to randomly sample from, the number of trees um, in the model itself, and then the number of uh, data points, the minimum number of data points to determine if a split can happen. Those are things that we can all tune and we can all, all um, adjust as we go to make the model fit the data better. In the pre-processing side, you do have some more tuning parameters. Um, PCA and, and KNN are kind of the um, ones that, that stick out. Uh, with K nearest neighbors, you can determine the number of neighbors. Again, the, the data can't tell you that. And PCA, the number of components to extract. With statistical models, uh, we call these structural parameters. Uh, with, with a regression, a binary regression, we can determine what uh, logic link we're using. So we can use a logistic regression link. Um, we can use a probit link or a C log log, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. And even, even down to longitudinal models, the correlation covariance structure of the data, we basically determine that um, to make the, the model fit the best. So when not to tune. Um, so there's two, two examples that, that they use in the book. The first one is when you're doing anything Bayesian, uh, sorry, if you have a prior distribution, you can't then use the model to uh, tune your prior distribution, right? That needs to be set ahead of time. Um, and then also this one, this one they said was a little bit um, more arguable, but basically the number of trees really isn't a tuning parameter. It's not something that you would tune. It is something that you set. Um, but it doesn't need to be tuned. The whole purpose of setting, you know, basically you just, you don't use the number of trees to change the way um, the model can predict the data. You use the number of trees to make sure it's excessive enough that the data itself is stable or the, the model is stable. So they use that as an example of what not to tune. When we go through random forest, which I'll show you that that's, that's set um, at just a sufficiently large enough number which they say kind of 1,000 to 2,000 range. Can I, can I cut in here for some questions? Please. <laughs> so I, I definitely understand that the, the prior distribution isn't tuned in the sense that those other hyperparameters are tuned. Does that mean that you can't look at your data to see what a range would be? 
or is it just that you can look at your data, but you're not going to tune it in the sense that you're not looking at what the model performance would be for different prior distributions? Yeah, so that's a great question. I'm not a Bayesian. Okay. Uh, so I, I don't have um, the, the book answer on that. I think when, when they're using it as an example here, um, they're using the tune, really when they say when not to tune, which is just basically um, optimizing the algorithm by changing the parameter, right? That's what we don't want to do with, with the Bayesian stuff. Um, but certainly if, if it requires you to understand a range and set a certain number that you think it is, um, that makes sense that you would just set that as a number and not use the tune function. Yeah, I think, I mean, just technically, once you have tuned a prior, it's not really a prior anymore. Like you tuned it by uh, applying data and creating a posterior, basically. So I think that's basically what it's about. And it's it's just honesty. Like the, if you are saying that my prior distribution was this, it's it's not really anymore. But like there are ways that you can make that work where it's like a, you know, updating priors versus tuning priors, I think. Great. Any, any other questions on that? Well, on the rent, uh, if you're going to get to it later, we can, we can get to it later, but on the number of trees, how do you know what is a sufficient number of trees <laughs> so that it's stable if you're not tuning it? Like to, to my first instance would be, okay, well, I'll try a bunch of different numbers of trees to see what's stable and then you're tuning it. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I was just going to say that I think kind of the idea is he's saying that um, the world has tuned it and as long as you have a thousand or so, you're good. Like technically you could tune it, but um, you don't need to. It's not so much that you shouldn't. It's that a thousand is good. So go ahead and use a thousand. Oh, you want 2000? Yeah, okay. Um, I, I don't know. I'm pretty sure I have tuned number of trees before. So uh, I thought that was an interesting point. Um, I'm glad to just and use see the default. The other side of that is if you if you only have, you know, a really small number where it's not stable and you allow it to tune over those unstable ones, you might get really good, a really good fit, right? Just based on the on the data where, where it just isn't uh, applicable outside of that. That's oh, that's true. Yeah, that, okay. yeah. You want to be way above the tuning number would be. So maybe you would tune, but the way you're tuning is: do I want ten or a hundred or a thousand or ten thousand? You know, something like that. Um, and you go pa you go one step past what you think you need, is kind of the idea there, I think, because it, it is something that could very well lead to overfitting. Yeah, it is interesting that there's not. Well, maybe there is a default um, for the number of those. Uh, there must, must be in there, although it shows that as null. I think they use a package default, right? Or is there... Oh, that would make sense, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. By the way, only 50 to 100 trees is required, or is like what they recommend for bagging. That seems like pretty low <laughs> to me, but I, I don't know. Good. All right. Thank you for that question, Jeff. Yeah, thank you. All right. So the next thing that they talk about is, is kind of, is another example is using, you know, what metrics should really determine, you have to be careful what metrics you're using because different metrics could, could you lead you different ways when you're thinking about um, tuning, um, tuning more, more at the structural level, at least that's the example they use. Um, so the example I use is, is in a neural network, you can determine, right, if you're going to use a binary, and I, I'm not at all versed in neural networks, but if you're going to use a binary classification, you can determine what 
uh, link function that you're going to use for that. So that essentially becomes a tuning parameter. So what I did is I made a really simple, um, took our AIMS data, you know, split it, did our cross fold uh, that we've been using and looked at, uh, I should have it up there, but it doesn't, um, just looked at, you know, again, something very simple. I looked at the only binary thing in there, which was central air. So does a house have central air? And I tried to see if the sale price in the year that it was remodeled could somehow be predictive of that, right, as a, as a binary outcome. This is what the graph looks like. There are some issues with it. Just follow along and I'll, we can talk about some of those um, as we go. Okay, so if we looked at just metrics and we said, hey, which link function should we use? We could use logistic regression, which is the logit, um, the probit, or the complementary log log. If we did those and looked at log likelihood statistics or likelihood statistics, we would pick the logit because it has the, the lowest negative number, the highest number, however you want to look at it, um, as you go. And if we plot those out, we actually see on the left-hand side that the log likelihood um, numbers are actually for the probit, or I'm sorry, for the logistic, which is the logit, is significantly better than the probit and the C log log. Okay, because it's the closest to zero. But if instead we use the area under the rock curve as the metric to determine, when we lay these out, there's no significant difference um, between those, those three different things. When we graph it out, we see the same thing. Um, the dotted line and straight lines um, correspond to those three different things essentially no real difference in the predictive capability of that. But he used that as an example, or they use that as an example to say, hey, you know, you might wanna look at as you're kind of thinking about some of these, think about the metrics that you're using because different metrics will lead you in different directions. You may wanna look at all of them to figure out not just is it significant or statistically different, um, but is it you know, reasonably different, which here you wouldn't really see a, a reasonable difference, so it might not matter. Obviously, again, there's a lot of issues with, you know, this, this model that I've set up to include all the numbers at 1950. Um, don't know why that happened. It's also very unbalanced. So that's why the, the line isn't very predictive at all. Okay, so can we make our model too good? And of course, yes, overfitting is really the big concern. So you have underfitting, right? When you, when you put a linear model to something that's clearly not linear you have kind of the desired uh, fitting and you have this overfitting. So if we overtune um, our model to the training data, so if we just use the training data, train on it without doing, uh, well, cross, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Hey, Tan, your mic's on. There he goes. <laughs> I think I was just very excited about what you're talking about. <laughs> um, so if you just use the training data or you haven't forbid to use the whole data set and train the algorithm on that, then you would, of course, you're basically training it to that data set and it may not be generalizable outside of that training set that you use. So the tip from the book is that using out of sample data is the solution for detecting when a model is overemphasizing the training set. So even if you get um, some uh, accuracy type measures in like the 0.95 range, if you use it at, in an out of sample uh, data set and it's like 0.3, you realize that you're overfitting the model. So you do have to be careful of that and making sure there's not leakage, making sure there's not, um, or making sure that you're using cross validation seems to be a pretty good uh, approach or something that he continuously goes back to um, can help with some of those before applying it to the testing. Okay, so different ways to tune, and we'll kind of get into these. So grid search will be the next chapter, chapter 13. A grid search, basically you just put out a bunch of numbers in a grid pattern, right? So in this three-dimensional, four-dimensional space, we put a bunch of numbers out there um, in, a, in a grid pattern, and one of those should be fairly close to the optimal solution, right? That's kind of the idea behind it. You can also do a random search, um, which is another type of grid search, but a random search where you just randomly pick numbers. So they don't fall necessarily in that very 
nice grid spot. There might be some areas that are underserved, some that are overserved, but you actually, if you look at the green lines above and on the side, you actually get better coverage with a random search. Um, you can see that on the bottom one. And then chapter 14, we're gonna talk iterative search. Um, I, didn't I, I feel like we, we just have to interrupt that Tony has an important question in the chat of, are these Python generated graphs? <laughs> these are, uh, <laughs> no, no, uh, these are stolen from Wikipedia. Okay, so, so they probably are one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I started thinking about, how, you know, how could I make this in ggplot? It'd be, it'd be a great, like, Tidy Tuesday thing, but I just couldn't, <laughs> couldn't do it. I think all of those pieces are possible to do in ggplot, but we'll have to get like uh, Cedric to tell us how to do it or something. Yeah. Because, um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, and then for chapter 14, iterative search, where you basically, if I understand it correctly, the you iteratively search over it. So you you test a number test another number and you just keep going. And basically as you iterate, you get closer and closer and closer to the optimal one. So it, it kind of goes towards that optimal solution and it tries to find the most optimal. Um, there were some Bayesian ones that um, did this. I didn't find too many others or examples. So I'm interested, you know, whoever does the iterative search one will be good. Uh, any questions on those? So those are some diff different ways to then tune. So basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna give a range to tune and then tell dials, the dials package um, within this range, either do a grid search or a random search or an iterative search of some sort. Okay, so we use the dials package or the tidy models uses the dials package to do this. Um, and there's really two different places that you can tune for these. There's the main arguments, um, which is like ran forest. And then there's the engine specific um, tuning parameters like Ranger. Okay, and we'll use those as the examples. Good starting points for these is this Tidy Models um, website. I link these in. These actually go to both the model um, and then underneath the arguments that go with it. These really, the, probably the best thing that these do, which I'll show you a different way to do it. Um, but these will show some of the, those main arguments. Okay. All right, so what does it look like? I'm trying to just go through the steps so I keep it straight. So we start with a recipe. We take, take the AIMS data, the training data. Um, I apply just a very small, uh, formula to it. So sale price being predicted by neighborhood, uh, living area, year it was remodeled and the building type. That's gonna be our recipe. And then from there we build our model. So for this one, we're gonna use the Ranger package to do a random forest and we'll do a reg uh, regression because we're looking at sale price. Very simple. So again, the ran forest is the main arguments. The set engine is the engine um, arguments. If you want to know the main arguments, you can use the args function, right? And that'll that'll push this down. Um, and basically, the three args that you can do um, the m tree, which is the number of um, parameters, so based on the, the number of predict of independent variables um, that you can sample from at each split, uh, the number of trees, and then the minimum number of observations before a split will happen. Um, if you want to look at engine specific arguments, there are a substantial number of those. Um, so the best place to do it is through the help menu. Um, that's, that's all I'll say there. I don't understand most of them. Okay. So here we have our base model, right? We've got our, our main model, set engine, set mode, and then um, we'll go into adding tuning parameters. So this is the same thing up top. What I've added in the random forest or the main arguments is M tree. And I'm saying I want to tune that. The number of trees I just set at 2,000 um, to you know go big or go home, and then the min n um, I asked to, for to tune it as well. I also did an engine specific uh, one, which is a regularization um, factor, and I did put an identifier in there reg, because otherwise the identifier becomes regularization dot factor. It's just lengthy. 
So in any of the tune parameters here, you can put an identifier if you want to change the name to make it more, more common. Okay. If you take that um, model specification, I, I put it as tune so it, you could understand that I've already tuned it. And if you just ask for the parameters, um, what it'll do is it'll show all the parameters that are set to be tuned. And there's three of them again. So there's the uh, entry, min n, and then the regularization factor. The part that's really important to, to look at this is, the, is underneath the object. So the n param means it's a numeric parameter um, as opposed to uh, character or factor parameter, I think, of the other ones. But next to that, you'll see under entry, there's a question mark. And under the other two, there's a plus. If it comes up as a plus, it means it's complete. Uh, it has the range already uh, predetermined. If it comes up as a question mark, it means that it's not complete and you need to set that range um, one way or another. Okay. So for entry, the way we could do that is we could just do a call to entry, which is a dials um, function. When we do that, we can see that it's randomly selected uh, predictors or independent variables, however you wanna call it. And it goes from one to some number. And that's why there's a question mark there. So we can either update that or uh, finalize it, which I'll talk about in a second. We can do that for any of the parameters. Um, so min n, even though it's already complete, we can do that and we see the range is gonna be from two to 40, which is preset. Again, we can update those if we want, we can adjust them or we can leave them at the preset um, number. If we wanna update it, we can just update it in place. So if you have a, a number of pipes, um, things going through, you can pull the parameters and just, just do a call to update. You can see when we do this, M tree, I just updated one to four, which is our original, um, because we only have four predictors in our small um, uh, recipe here. So when we do that, now there's a plus next to the M tree N param, which means it's now complete. So if we did the same call to M tree, it would be one to four and we would see that. The other way to do it is to finalize the tuning parameters, which is this is probably more realistic than what you're going to do. Because if it falls, sometimes, then, like for example, the number of uh, predictor variables that are in there, that could change based on your recipe, right? If you're going to if you're going to adjust the recipe, maybe that changes the number of parameters. Um, so they they recommend doing it in this way as part of your workflow. So from the workflow, you add your model, you add your recipe, um, and then you can pull out the parameters and then finalize those using the training data set. When I do that, it shows that M tree is now complete. But here's something that's interesting and I'm hoping someone can answer this because I have not been able to figure out why. When I finalize this um, or use the finalize function and then pull out the M tree dials object, it actually updated it to one to 74. 74 is the original number of predictors that are in there, not the ones from the recipe. I'm not entirely sure why that is. The example that they used in the book used all the variables, so they did come up with 74 as well. Um, so I don't know if that's something that I'm doing wrong or something that is part of this. Um, yeah, that, that's that's a good question. Because like after you do the step, the recipe steps, well, are you adding? Not really adding any variables. I'm not adding any variables, but I did add the formula as part of the recipe, right? I mean, you wouldn't use, I don't think a random forest would use all the variables if they're not in the formula. I don't think. You just did the, uh, well, you did the outcome variable squiggly line dot, right? So, yeah. I mean, that's, well, yeah, then that is all the oh, other. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Variables. No, I did not do the dot. Um, oh. Okay. I just did the I just did the list of the four variables with pluses after them. Huh. Um, yeah, so when I when I did that, I just this this was the Ames recipe, just sale price in the neighborhood, living area model building type. Yeah, that seems off. Yeah. Um, I'm but guessing the, that the idea is that if the recipe changes the number of variables, predictor variables, it is supposed to then um, finalize based on the after recipe poll. So, 
Yeah, I would guess it's something about that it thinks it changed or it's not sure that it didn't change. Um, and you might want to reprex it down and see if you can super simplify and maybe, maybe actually, maybe there's something that's not as specific as they think it is mm. <laughs> in there. Yeah, I can do. So that, that's where you tune. That's how you tune. That's where you tune. And basically this parameter object that the tune um, function does through the dials package um, creates the range of parameters. And then the grid function, there's a number of grid functions, but the grid function we use on that then takes that range and it kind of lays it out um, to optimize based on that grid. That's what I got. It's a cliffhanger, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I have a general question about uh, min n, so like the minimum node size. Like, I, I guess, like, I, I feel like this should be also sort of dependent on the data set. And I guess I'm just thinking of like an extreme case here, but like, say you had like, I don't know, a, a data set with like 50 records, you know, a min n greater than 50 doesn't make sense. But I, I know, I think it's default range is right. That is two to 40. Um, so yeah, well, hypothetically, if your data set had 30 records, you know, a min node size of 40 doesn't make sense. Uh, I always, so I don't know. I always, it's kind of like a, a corner case, but, um, okay. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a good point. And what scared me when I looked at the, all of the, the potential tuning parameters for the engine specific. So the Ranger package, there was a ton of them. And I feel like you could get lost in all of those, um, trying to figure those out unless you really knew what you're doing, which I don't. But you are, I mean, we are, we should know what we're doing, right? So surely you've used every single one of those parameters. <laughs> <laughs> I use tidy models so I don't have to use those other parameters. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I've got a question, and I think it was your first slide, 12.1. Okay. Yeah, I love this categor categorization between the different types of parameters. And I was thinking about these categories in relation to workflow sets. So someone correct me if I'm wrong here, but before workflow sets, we could only tune that first category, right? The true hyperparameters. Does the introduction of workflow sets allow us to tune the second and third categories now? Is that is that the new development? That's the second one, the pre-processing, you can actually tune. Oh. Yeah. Cool. Workflows allows you to, like, you, we couldn't, I don't remember the history, but we couldn't <laughs> tune it. Couldn't always tune them, but yeah, we can tune them. The to tune, you know, like, um, I think he has some examples with the PCA tuning in here somewhere. Yeah, under pre-processing. Um, and and I, I wonder if those are actually part of the engine specific as well. That, that would probably make more sense if those would fall under the engine specific, even though it's, um, but it is part of the pre-processing. So you would hope that's before. So yeah, I guess if so, you're- So, right, go ahead. Um, <laughs> well, I was just going to say that workflow sets lets you kind of tune, like, what is the model, you know, like a wider, a, a bigger, a higher level of um, tuning parameters. Like, it was possible to deal with those before, but a lot more manual than with workflow sets. You can say, eh, I don't know, like, choose which of these, or help me choose which of these recipes is the best. Um, so it is kind of a step up in the tuning. Um, he didn't edit this chapter for workflow sets. He edited a lot of other chapters and they just merged that in. Um, so that he did have that in mind already. I think actually, uh, <laughs> I think what I am saying is chapter 15 that was just added, that is screening many models. Um, it's kind of tuning between different uh, models. 
So does that is that really the third bullet then? The different. It's a it's a thing that's not exactly tuning. Okay. It's model selection over tuning per se. And I don't know. I haven't read the chapter yet. <laughs> I really appreciate this like breakdown at the beginning of the chapter, right? Or, like what you're showing right now. Uh, like it's so easy to kind of like overlook this way. I mean, I think we all can could put this list together if we really thought about it. But it's like really nice to have it like spelled out like it was and and it is now. And pretty much everything I ever see talks about hyperparameters and doesn't. Um... I don't know, emphasize that there are other things to tune, depending, you know, that's why recipes exists, basically, is you might need to tune uh, the number of components in PCA, for example. So, yeah, I like it. You know, even that counter example with the, the Bayesian priors, it's like, I, I hadn't even thought of that like <laughs> way before. But yeah, that makes sense when you, when you spell it out like that. All right, anyone have anything else? I thought this was a like a meaty chapter. There was a lot of information here. Um, and, you know, to their credit, like, I didn't come away with a lot of questions. Like, yeah, okay, that made sense. Thank you, you know. I think a lot of it also gets solved just by, you know, hey, making sure you're spending your data correctly early on because you know it's not that this chapter is pointless but you know spending your data definitely helps tune your model in a way it's not incorrect i would say yeah i think we were well prepared for the idea of you know overfitting is bad and we should do things to avoid that um so yeah That's like the number one, like, I, I don't remember reading from like a ISLR. That was like the first statistics book I read. And that's like hammered home, like immediately in that book. So it's, I feel like it's probably the first thing I was like, people that go into statistics or data science kind of like see. Um, and it was actually kind of put later in the chapter. So honestly, if it, if it was like the first thing they started out with, probably would have like dozed off. But uh, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's contextualized well. Cool. All right. So next week, Jim is going to chapter or going to present chapter thirteen on grid search. We are still looking for someone for chapter fourteen on iterative search, and then Tan will do screening many models. Um, and I'm checking with Max to see where he thinks we should put another review block in. It looks like fifteen is within the same section. But I don't know if 16 is also going to be within the same section and if 16 is coming soon or we're going to have to go off to another book or what. So, um, yeah. So <laughs> looking forward to seeing Grid Search next week with Jim. Okay, we'll be ready. All right. See ya. I see you guys. Thanks. Thanks, Andy. Bye. Thanks, Andy.